Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthy Hong Kong and welcome to the third in our series of interviews with Dr. Brian Kennedy of the National University of Singapore. In this video, Professor Kennedy talks about some of the aging clocks that his lab is using and also the importance of preventative healthcare in a world of aging population. And with that, let me start the interview. So biomarkers and aging clocks, of the ones that exist right now, I mean, do you have a view as to which one you think is the best, like the Horvath clock or I guess vascular age, or do you have a... Well, I, I think we're evaluating a lot of these. And so we're looking at them on three components, really, how accurate they are, how much they cost, and what part of you do I have to chop out to measure it? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I, because, you know, we're looking at things we can scale, right? So if it costs two thousand dollars to do something it's hard to scale if i have to take a muscle biopsy it's hard to get you to do that right so ideally we want things that we can do from saliva or maybe blood draw the most uh mm -hmm. that are reasonably cost effective and that are accurate you know i think the epigenetic clocks looking at dna methylation are the farthest along and we're certainly looking at those um those are you know i i, I think they they're close to being validated in the sense that they predict, they do the things you'd want. They predict age, they can predict disease onset, they can predict mortality looking in backwards using these uh, long-term longitudinal studies where samples were available. And we're beginning to see that they're responsive to interventions. So those are the things you want out of a biomarker. And so I think they're very promising. Uh, and we're looking at different strategies to measure uh, epigenetic age using that system. Uh, you know, there's, they're probably the most accurate ones I think right now are things that combine something like that with normal physiologic parameters you can get from the blood. So like grim age, I think is probably a little bit more accurate than, than the original Horvath clock. Um, but we're also looking at other things as well. So uh, we're using a, a a high-end camera to generate 3D facial images. And um, it's been shown in a uh, collaborator of ours, uh, Jackie Han in China, that she can predict biologic age from reconstructing facial images. Uh, so that's, that is completely non-invasive and cheap once you have the camera. Uh, and so we're interested in that. Uh, we're working with a company called Jero that can calculate biologic age just from complete blood cell count analysis. So that's very easy to do. There's a machine you can just run blood through and get the data immediately almost. Uh, and they have some interesting data there. But there's also microbiome-based clocks now and transcriptomic clocks and other and clocks based on measuring specific combinations of specific risk factors in the blood uh, or, or adding in other components. So uh, this is really, there have been two major advances in the aging field. One is the interventions which I've been heavily involved in, but the other is the, the clocks, and that's only over the last five to 10 years. And so I don't think we know which are the best ones yet and how much they overlap with each other, but I'm really excited because they really give us tools now to start to see if our interventions are working in humans. And I think there's sufficient data out there to believe that some of these are gonna be pretty accurate in their measurement. Yes, I can certainly see that you know, if you have a trial like six months, wasn't it? Yeah, you can't see uh, like how people are surviving or not. You have to use these markers. No, we, we can't do survival at all. And even if we look at disease prevention, like in TAME, that's a three-year study with mm. thousands of people. I mean, <laughs> at, at multiple sites. So, you know, it's just not cost-effective to look at 10 or 15 different things and compare them if you have to do that kind of a study. Now, possibly... To get the FDA to believe you, you end up at the end to have to do that study, but at least by then we'll have a lot of data on a bunch of different interventions and be able to predict which one's most likely to work and how to measure it. And I think that's, that's um, you know, we, I don't want to enter into a $50 million study unless we can have a better feel that it's going to work than we have right now. I think metformin is worth doing because it's with NEARS studies. Mm -hmm. Not, not so much because I love metformin, it's an interesting candidate, but the main reason is it sets a, it sets a um, precedent for uh, doing health span studies. And so uh, once that precedent set, and then the kinds of studies we're doing yield the things that are most likely to have the biggest effect, 
and, and in what populations, then we can, we may have to do studies on that scale to get final approval. But right now I want to just figure out what works, especially with natural products too, because with natural products, you don't necessarily have to go through the whole FDA approval process, depending, as long as you make reasonable claims and don't exceed claims that you're allowed to make, then it's a much easier path to market for natural products. So um, the biomarkers might be sufficient to get widespread use of natural products. Mm. Yes. So can I ask, so you have a, a couple of trials planned in Singapore. So which, um, which aging clocks are you going to be using for those? Have you decided? So we'll, def we'll definitely use epigenetic clock. We're going to use the facial pattern, the complete blood cell count, and we're still looking into some other potential clocks to add on to that. It's always a resource issue. The more you add, the more you, <laughs> the more cost. Yeah. So, uh, and, but again, we're, we're, look, we're limiting ourselves to only things that we can do from, from saliva or at worst to blood drops. So. Right, yes. Um, so if, I, when I go and get my blood done and I'm looking at my biomarkers, so what would be the key metrics? I guess, and, and I guess if you're doing the same, if you're doing a, a biomarker check in your, your, yeah. um, Charles, which markers are the key ones for you? What are you looking for? Well, I think, you know, if you're looking at general health, there are a panel of markers, things that measure inflammation, things that measure metabolism, uh, um, and uh, a variety of other things. And you can go to companies now like Nightingale that'll measure a bunch of different parameters from a very small amount of serum. And they've been on studies that have linked a combination of those parameters to aging. And we're actually working with them too, to look at the metabolite profiles in the blood. So um, that's certainly something to do. I, I think that I, I'm actually very excited about going back to some of these micronutrients and natural products or, and, and vitamins, because you know, the vitamin studies have largely are viewed as a failure when you look at their meta-analysis. But if you go back and look at how those studies were done, a lot of them were done a while ago, and, the, and very rarely did they actually measure the levels of vitamins in the blood for people at baseline and how much it changed when you supplemented it. And um, actually, I think there are, op there are optimal ranges for all of these micronutrients and vitamins. And if we can take a personalized approach to try to hit um, the optimal range, so you give people what they need and don't give people what they don't need, uh, then I think we might have a big impact on health span and lifespan. And so that's something that we're trying to look at from a more personalized perspective here. But that's something you can also look at, you know, and people ask me all the time, should I take vitamin D? And I ask them, well, what's your vitamin D level? They don't know. They haven't measured. It. So, you know, there are a lot of these simple parameters that you can look at and try to optimize it. I think you might find it, it helps not just in the long term, but it might help you feel better and, and uh, mitigate some of the risk you have for diseases in the short term as well. Right. I mean, yes, we wanted to, I mean, I take vitamin D and we, I wanted to get my vitamin D checked, but I've actually mm. not found it easy to find, to, to get somewhere to yeah. check that. It's not that easy to check some of these things. And, and uh, um, I think that this is a problem with a little bit with, uh, general practitioners still don't really think about aging. You know, they're, they're, uh, you know, they, they don't look at a, a list of things that might give you a good readout on aging. And, and they tend to just uh, look at a few parameters in a very short time and say, Oh, you're doing well, or you're pre-diabetic or whatever, but there, there's not enough depth that doing good health span <laughs> or healthy, uh, 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 medical studies, and, and uh, I, I wish we could educate more about people doing preventative medicine. The perception is that th there's no point in doing preventative medicine because people won't comply anyway. But I think that's changing. I think that there are more and more people that are interested in, in how they're doing and are willing to make lifestyle changes to stay healthy longer, and they're just uh, having trouble getting the, the data, like you just mentioned, and, and they're not getting good advice. You know, even in Singapore, which has a great healthcare system, you know, most people go to these poly clinics and these poor doctors, they have like six minutes per patient. You know, if you, if, and they're just all day long, they're running from one room to the next. If you have six minutes, you don't have time to talk about healthy lifestyles and, and look at 
the, the specific little risk factors that may be relevant 10 years from now. You're dealing with what's going on now and what needs to be done now, and then you're on to the next patient. And um, that's part of the problem. The, the primary care uh, is just, it, I, globally, is just not really targeted toward healthy aging that much. Mm. Yes, it's, it, the individual needs to take more control over it, really. But it, yeah. it, the, the data or the information that's available is difficult to find and, and some of it are contradictory, I must admit. Um, yeah, I get, it is somewhat, and I get the sense that you spend an inordinate amount of time looking at these things too, which is great. And so you can make informed decisions, but most people don't have time for that. So. We have to, or they don't have the inclination to do that, you know. And so we need to find affordable strategies to inform people and give them interventions that are going to keep them healthy before they get sick. I mean, that's the only real solution to this problem. We can't just keep building hospitals and nursing homes. I, I think that it's not going to work economically to do that. And people don't want that. You know, they want to be healthy. But, you know, I don't want to get Alzheimer's and then get treated for it. I want to not get Alzheimer's, you know, and... <laughs> And uh, we need to convince people that th that's possible, and, or at least we can delay those things much later in life. And, and I think that, you know, sometimes I get frustrated because I've been arguing this for a long, long time, but, uh, and the resources really haven't been there to, to, to push this concept. Uh, but it's changing now. There's a lot of private sector money in the space. And uh, I think governments are listening and, and in the short, near term, they're gonna start really making the kinds of commitments that are needed to, to make a difference. But uh, the, I, there's one slide I use, which has aging leading to all these different diseases. And I swear, Matt Caberline and I started using that slide in 2006. If I, if I see it one more time, I'm going to jump out the window. It's <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. For us, the key takeaways were that there have been two recent advances in the aging field. One is interventions, the other is the aging clocks. So Dr. Kennedy provided an update on the state of play in biological clock technology and discussed the requirements to create a composite clock that looks at multiple factors. The second was that the current healthcare system doesn't look at aging and its outcomes. Although more people are interested in learning about healthy living and are willing to make the lifestyle changes, they have trouble getting the data and getting good advice. And finally, is the importance of establishing preventative medicine to keep people healthy before they become sick. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.